Uh, the Capitalist Unconscious, Marx and Lacan by Samuel Tomsek. This is part three of chapter four. It's called The Fifth Discourse? Question mark. The university discourse was not Lacan's final word on capitalism. A further development took place in 1972 when he determined the foreclosure of castration as the defining feature of capitalist discourse and in a conference in Milan proposed its formula, which many consider an independent structure, the fifth discourse. And of course, there's a diagram, it's page 385, go find it, I don't know how to describe it. This development is rather surprising, given that the theory of discourses is grounded on a strict order that supports only four formations, while other discourses depart from a quarter turn, which passes from the fundamental logic, the master's discourse, to other immediate structures and allows only four such turns, without altering the places and their mutual relations. Capitalism seems to accomplish a turn that does not displace the elements, but the structural places, and thereby alters their mutual relations. It inverts the position of truth and agent, which makes the subject appear as an autonomous agent and the initiator of an infinite circulation, from which there is no breakout. The vectors show that the capitalist discourse is grounded on the foreclosure of the impossibility of totalization that marks other discourses, an impossibility that is structurally determined by the fact that the signifiers constitute an open system of differences. The capitalist Torsion of the master's discourse, however, claims to establish the missing relation between the subject and the object, and even proposes the paradigmatic example of this relation, financial capital. The immediate consequence of the torsion is rejection of the split that marks the place of truth, which is, according to Marx and Freud, occupied by a subject whose being is marked by inconsistency and metonymy because it depends on the system of differences, signifier and exchange value. To this truth, capitalism opposes its own truth. The subject, here capital, contains a vital power which supports its automatic growth. Lacan's formula anticipates the appearance of the absolute autonomy of financial capital and the epoch of financialization, but it also specifies its meaning Financialization is the rejection of the contradiction between capital and labor power from the subjective and social reality, and its replacement by the imminent and seemingly productive split of capital. Just as in the university discourse, the truth of the master becomes the, the determining factor that structures and destabilizes reality in the same move. We can recognize in the proposed torsion of the master's discourse, a translation of Marx's abbreviated, abbreviated circulation, MM, in which money directly engenders more money and value representation coincides with value production. The fantasy of the subject's self-sufficiency, completeness, and vitality thus echo echoes Marx's point regarding fetishism, and for this reason cannot represent an actual discursive formation, but formalizes the appearance that traverses all stages in the fetishization of capitalist abstractions. It is not a fifth discourse, it is a fake discourse. Moreover, the rejected negativity returns in the form of the crisis, which necessarily involves production of surplus populations and demolition of what Milner called the waged bourgeoisie, whose social task is to mediate and neutralize the class conflict between the capitalists and the proletariat. If Lacan's fake fifth, fifth discourse formalizes anything, then it is the following. As the dominant subject of this process, in which it alternately assumes and loses the form of money and the form of commodities, but preserves and expands itself through all these changes, value requires above all an independent form by means of which its identity with itself may be asserted. Marx describes fictitious capital as ubergreifendes subject, dominating and self-exceeding subject. The fetishization of capitalist abstractions contains its own labor theory of value, according to which capital is the true laboring power, a subject that represents dollar to S1 and engenders A to dollar itself. 
Both meanings of Übergreifen address the direct continuity, continuity of representation and production and self-valorization. But there is a more appropriate critical term for this operation, self-fetishization, the ultimate obscenity of capitalism, which contaminates all levels of production and makes of the most banal commodities sublime incarnations of value. Capital is labor power without a symptomatic social embodiment, but therefore surrounded by a multitude of objects through which the vital capitalist spectrality adopts and abolishes its, its sensual form. Capital here assumes another feature of the subject of the signifier, the alteration of appearance and disappearance, the fort da movement that Freud described in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, and Lacan later analyzed as the subject's staging of its metonomic becoming. But here the meta metonom the metonom nah. but here the metonymization of subject capital is brought down to its presumed self-identity, which drives its transformation. The same spectrality insists in the master's discourse. Not only is capital S1 pure difference, like the signifier, but also the appearance of self-valorization immediately follows from the structural disclosure, which enables the joining of surplus value to the initial value, the vector A to S1. The torsion of the master's discourse displaces this relation to the phantasmatic fusion of the subject and the object, A to dollar, thereby concealing the mutual heterogeneity of labor power and surplus value. What political economy does it translate the fetishist attitude in human actions into theoretical constructions, which identify the subject of politics and capital and subsume politics under the structural tendency of capital to self-valorization? In Marx's critical scenario, however, the subject of politics is radically heterogeneous to the presumed vital forces of capital, and its social embodiment, the proletarian, is the necessary condition for reversing the relation between politics and economy, and for detaching the subject of politics from its integration into commodity form. The spectrality of capital and the political economic belief it causes the invisible hand of the market, the quasi-natural necessity of economic laws in liberalism, the absolute autonomy of fictitious capital in neoliberalism, not only denounces the circulation, M, M, as appearance, but above all questions, the epistemological status of economic knowledge. Political economists, these self-proclaimed scientists of value, treat capital as an autonomous subject, and in the same move, situate their own economic discipline as a subject supposed to know. The belief in economy is not only limited to economists, but makes of everyone an amateur economist, in the common belief that economic knowledge can not only analyze past events, retrospection, and the present state of the market, diagnostic, but also foretell the future of financial flows, prognostic. The presupposition is that economy is a rigorous and positive science of value, with privileged insight into the spirit of capitalism, and consequently that the, ra the rationality of the economy is the same as the rationality of financial markets. The ongoing crisis once again unmasked the rootedness of dominating political economic ideologies in this speculative belief and denounced a liberal and neoliberal economy as a pseudoscience. Marx's analysis of fictitious capital nevertheless assumes a careful position in relation to the autonomy of capital. He does not denounce the structural appearance of self-valorization as a pure and innocent performative fiction, as it has destabilizing consequences, which manifest through the repetition of economic crises and make of capitalism as such an ongoing crisis, the permanent revolution described by the Communist Manifesto. The movement of capital seems to overcome all dependency on labor, but the negativity is not eliminated from the system, as it returns in the form of systematic instability. The tendency of structural appearances to absolute autonomy is another description for crisis. The third volume of capital situates this instability subsequent to the progressive autonomization of fetishist appearances in the following way. As interest-bearing capital, and particularly in its immediate form, of interest-bearing money capital, capital obtains its pure fetish form, 
M.M. being the subject, a thing for sale. Firstly, by way of its continuing existence as money, a form in which all capital's determinations are dissolved and its real elements are invisible. Money is, in fact, the very form in which the distinctions between commodities as different use values are obliterated, and hence also the distinctions between the industrial capitals, which consist of these commodities and the conditions of their production. It is the form in which value, and here capital, exists as autonomous exchange value. In the reproduction process of capital, the money form is an evanescent uh, moment, a moment of mere transition. On the money market, on the contrary, capital always exists in this form. Secondly, the surplus value it creates, here again in this form of money, appears to accrue to it as, to it as such. Like the growth of trees, to the generation of money seems a property of capital in this form of money capital. Again, what Marx claims here is not that we have the good solid ground for the production of use values and the bad progressive abstraction from commodity production. The fetishist circle is closed and the most immediate production is always already mediated by the capitalist abstractions, which display the same autonomy at the level of the commodity form and fictitious capital. The problem lies in false representation of the autonomy of exchange value. Marx also writes, in MM we have the irrational form of capital, the misrepresentation and objectification of the relations of production, in its highest power. The misrepresentation lies precisely in objectification, which makes the autonomy of structural relations appear in the form of an uncanny, self-engendering, and absolutely autonomous thing. Here it becomes obvious once again that the subject is in any case not misrepresented. The subject is foreclosed. This is the central point of Marx's critique of fetishism. Or, stated differently, the subject is misrepresented insofar as it is fictionalized as a positive, vital force of capital, and not as decentralized negativity that traverses the universe of capitalist abstractions and sabotages the seemingly self-generating mechanism of value. The relations of production are represented without any trace of negative production, such as of indebted subjects, surplus populations, and so on. The autonomy of exchange value is the rational kernel from which the representation of social relations should depart. Yet the fetishist belief makes the irrational move of mistaking the autonomy of relations for the autonomy of the object. The abstraction from use value eliminates the difference between commodities and commodity producing commodity, the product and the producer. Capital, of course, can also become the producer, but then we are dealing with the structure of the university discourse in which the product of appropriation of surplus product is the indebted subject. It is impossible to assimilate the representation of the subject through the system of differences. This is why capital can never coincide entirely with the subject, abolish the negativity of labor power, and resolve the initial paradox of the commodity universe, according to which there is one commodity that differs from other commodities, and in the end embodies the non-identity of commodities and values with themselves. This symptomatic commodity finally unveils the non-identity of capital. Capital is neither a subject nor an object, but an internally broken process. The foreclosure of negativity strengthens the belief in the existence of the other. Through misrepresentation, the market can appear as a positive entity, not merely the abstract other of liberalism. The neutral and spontaneous rationality of Smith's invisible hand but also the capricious other of neoliberalism, which demands cuts, saving renunciation from its economic subjects. Financialization financialization intensifies the unconscious belief in the other's positive existence, and the god of the economists effectively replaces the god of philosophers as well as the god of religion. This change is the direct result of the capitalist inversion in the social function of fetishism, its transformation into the fetishism of the object, which allows only divinities, according to the model of the god of economists. The circle of belief seems entirely closed. The more the market reality is unsustainable or unstable, the stronger the belief in the other becomes. 
the more the fetishization of capital appears as its self-fetishization, and the more vulgar political economy subordinates politics. For vulgar, for vulgar economics, which seeks to present capital as an independent source of wealth, a value creation, this form is of course a godsend, a form in which the source of profit is no longer recognizable, and in which the result of the capitalist production process, separate from the process itself, obtains an autonomous existence. Again, the most problematic aspect of economic fetishism is not the assertion of discursive autonomy, but the substantialization of capital, the detachment of the autonomy of exchange value from the negative it inevitably produces. Based on this appearance, we can again focus on the relations between the elements in Lacan's formula of the capitalist discourse, which allow the following reformulation. There is another... Um, Diagram, page 394. It's called the Capitalist Circle. So, find that. This writing explains Lacan's remark that the master's discourse embraces everything, even what thinks of it as revolutionary. The master's discourse accomplishes its own revolution in the other sense of doing a complete circle. The permanent revolution sustained by the fetishization of financial abstractions incessantly returns to its departure. No permutation of elements alters the structural relations. The exit from capitalism is inexperienced as a structural impossibility, or is experienced as a structural impossibility. Indeed, this cannot go better, but the thing is that it goes too fast, that it consumes itself. It consumes itself so well that it wears itself out. The crisis, not of the master's discourse, but of the capitalist discourse, which is its substitute, is open. The self-fetishization of capital is synonymous with crisis, but this crisis is merely a total distortion of class struggle. Eventually, it produces a critical mass of surplus population, which reintroduces the class antagonisms into the picture. This is also one of the results in the ongoing crisis, in which the old antagonism between capital, between capital and labor power reemerged in the core of the credit creditor-debtor relation. Lacan's formula of the capitalist discourse continues the line according to which capitalism essentially tends towards the foreclosure of castration. Its worldview strives to heal the subjective split by way of the fetishization of the object, which would establish a univocal relation between the subject and jouissance. Of course, the foreclosure of castration does not imply that jouissance becomes accessible. On the contrary, the foreclosure radicalizes the deadlock of jouissance and turns the superego into an insatiable demand for jouissance. The imperative of jouissance throws additional light on the problem that Dostoevsky addressed through the death of God. For, Do for Dostoevsky, this death implies that everything is permitted, thereby proposing an imaginary and inherently religious understanding of its consequences. Together with the death of authority, the symbolic mandate of the law collapses, the barricade between the subject and jouissance, which makes the latter immediately accessible. Lacan repeatedly proposed to correct Dostoevsky on this point with the lesson contained in the Freudian myth, according to which the symbolic law emerged from the killing of the primordial father. The Freudian conclusion directly reverses Dostoevsky's assumption. The death of God does not abolish the law. It constitutes it and implies universal prohibition. If God is dead, then nothing is permitted. The death of the obscene father, this uncastrated bearer of castration, who limits his son's access to jouissance, does not bring liberation from prohibition. The dead father returns in the symbolic in the form of the superego. Freud's founding myth contains a rational kernel, according to which the abolition of the real obstacle constitutes the symbolic prohibition, and the signifier colonizes the place that the father's death left empty. The imperative character of the signifier becomes the symbolic representative of the dead father. However, this Freudian conclusion remains within the paradigm of the contradiction between the signifier and jouissance, which marked Lacan's early developments and fails to account for the genesis of capitalist morality, which grounds the production of jouissance on its renunciation. 
Renunciation does not disappear, neither in the regime of prohibition nor in the regime of permission. While Dostoevsky's conclusion turned out to be too religious, Freud's remained too mythical. Lacan's second return to Freud finds and marks the response that allows him to situate the real consequence of the death of God, which resides in the transformation of the relation between the signifier and jouissance. If God is dead, then jouissance is neither allowed nor prohibited, prohibited, but ordered and imposed. This imposition can be situated in every particular commodity, and more generally in the commodity form as the privileged form of jouissance in capitalism. The death of God undermines the demarcation of prohibition from permission, and while the permission of jouissance still implies a possible defense, negation, or disavowal, which prevents the intrusion of jouissance into the subject, the imperative abolishes this barrier. Castration is displaced from the symbolic law, which permits and prohibits, to the imperative of jouissance, which now imposes its own obscene law. The capitalist foreclosure of castration and the transformation of jouissance into an imperative additionally situate Lacan's identification of the student with the helot, or helot, helot, helo, hello, helot. <laughs> Lacan's prosopopoeia of the regime, look at them enjoying, can be read as the flip side of the prosopopoeia of the capitalist superego. Jacques Alain Miller has argued that this pros Prosopopoeia reveals the impotence of the regime's gaze to produce shame and to be the bearer of castration. But there is much more at stake in this metaphor than the impotence of the gaze. The gaze is rather the incarnation of the regime's power. It places the subject in Lacan's concrete case, the student, in the position of the object of the regime's jouissance, hence in the position of perversion. The subjects offer themselves to the regime's gaze and shamelessly exhibit jouissance, not knowing the, that the regime in the position they assume establishes the continuity between jouissance and labor. Once in the position of surplus object, the students are themselves studied by the regime's gaze, their demand for jouissance without castration, vivre sans temps mort, jouir sans entrave. To recall the famous graffiti from 1968, is the productive ground for the jouissance of the system. Life without boredom, dead time, and enjoyment without restriction or without castration inaugurate a new, more radical and invisible form of exploitation. Of course, the inevitable truth of creativity, mobility, and flexibility of labor is the creativity, mobility, and flexibility of the capitalist forms of domination. Masochism gives the key to the capitalist foreclosure of castration. One of the main differences between masochism and its opposite, sadism, is in the articulation of jouissance with shame. Um, sad, sades, sades, I don't know, bureaucratic descriptions of torture, show that the sadist's aim is not to turn pain into pleasure, but precisely to cause shame. Shame signals jouissance and emerges at the point when the victim becomes aware that her enjoyment has become visible. In Said, Sade, shame is the sign of castration. It therefore makes sense to describe Sade as the one who suspended the commodification of jouissance and thereby reintroduced negativity into enjoyment. Sade could draw a limit to fetishist jouissance because his position remained in the grey zone between the ancien regime of the lord and the serf and the new regime of the capitalist and the labourer. Shame confronts the subject with its own status as a commodity producing commodity, hence as a producer of the jouissance of the system, whereby we can again recall that Lacan declares the superego super to be the imperative of jouissance in, ref in reference to Sade, or Sade, Sade, Sade. In this respect, sadism remains an essential component of the capitalist dispositif, a component that nevertheless addresses the truth of the conversion of the prohibition of jouissance into its injunction. At the same time, masochism is not only a perversion in which commodity fetishism plays a significant role, but also the perversion that is essentially defined by the absence of shame, the neutralization of the castrating power of the master's gaze. While in Sade's 
scenarios, the distribution of the roles seems univocal. Masochism blurs the fact that behind its contract, a subversion of domination took place. The subject who can enjoy in the position of the object is the only true master, while the apparent executor is merely a prop, a subject for whom the contract presupposes not to enjoy. The contract demands a castrated master, deprived of the power to cause shame. It prevents him from causing pain, which would exceed a certain limit. The role of the contract in masochism shows why there cannot be any sexual relation between the sadist and the masochist. In sadism, the involuntarily, char the involuntarily character of jouissance is crucial. The victim finds in torture more than she expects. She encounters the negativity of castration in the, in the intertwining of pain and jouissance, while masochism neutralizes the possibility of deviation from phantasmatic jouissance in pain into the real pain of jouissance. Sadism reveals the truth of jouissance. Das Anbehagen im Genibin, discontent in enjoyment, whereas masochism avoids the moment of this discontent by taking unpleasure as an immediate source of pleasure, thereby establishing the alliance between sexuality and the rejection of castration through the commodity form. In this respect, the masochist would indeed be the perfect subject of capitalism, someone who would enjoy being a commodity among others. While assuming the role of surplus labor, the position of the object that willingly satisfies the systemic demands, the capitalist regime demands from everyone to become ideal masochists, and the actual message of the superego's injunction is, enjoy your suffering, enjoy capitalism.